Right. So studying medicine, dentistry and veterinary medicine abroad in 2022. Um, I'm going to start by introducing who we are in a little bit more detail. A Star Future really is designed to help students in the UK. That was our first mission. We do help people from elsewhere as well, but we essentially designed to help people from the UK to access English taught higher education in Europe and further afield. Now, when it comes to medicine, dentistry and veterinary medicine, these are obviously the subjects that keep our phones ringing off the hook. These are the ones where people have what I can only describe as mixed motivation for wanting to go abroad. It's not always a positive decision to want to do this. Sometimes it's motivated by not getting a place in the UK. That's not to say that this is a bad decision. I can genuinely point to examples where it's clearly a better decision to make, but it is different from the motivation that most of the students we have um, come to us with, let's put it that way. I should also point out at this stage um, that we are not really an agent. We didn't get into this as an agent as such. We have been more of a marketing consultant to international universities. We do work, however, as an agent with some of the universities I'll talk to you about a little bit later on. This is largely because that's the way the universities want to do it. Is, this, is the agency model one that I necessarily agree with? Not necessarily. Is it one where agents are the bad guys and universities are the good guys? That is also not true. Um, so you have to be a bit careful how you, you know, how you approach these issues. But what we try to do with everybody we work with is be completely open and transparent. So no matter what our relationship is with you or with the university, at least you know exactly what is going on and what we can and can't do. And I'm happy to talk in a little bit more detail about this um, later on. But for now, I'd just like to introduce you to what the opportunities are. These are all listed on our website. We maintain a database of courses taught in English in Europe. Obviously, we don't bother so much with the United States, Canada and so on, because, well, hey, everything's in English there. Um, but this is the information that I can share with you about where you should be looking for options in medicine, first of all. Um, currently, we are aware of 85 medical schools in the EU, not including Ireland and the, well, the UK, obviously. Um, the, the biggest single number are now in Italy, followed by Poland, Romania, Bulgaria and Czech Republic. I don't think that will come as a surprise to many of you, but essentially your options are Central and Eastern Europe or Italy or one or two examples in places like Malta, Cyprus, and in fact, one in Germany right now, which is, well, I'll come back to it, but it's actually a Romanian medical school on German soil. What are the fees for studying medicine? Well, this gives you a rough idea of what you are letting yourself in for financially. Uh, Italy for the public universities there. The figure that I've put there, 4,620 euros, is kind of the maximum that you would pay. Um, it's a bit difficult with, with Brexit and everything to know exactly what an e, a British passport holder would pay, but no more than that in a public university in Italy. As you can see, the private universities are quite a bit more, but they do usually have scholarships available for everybody. So you can bring those fees down a little bit. We're certainly not aware of any British students who are paying at the 20,000 end of that price range. Um, 16 would be something that would be more comfortable as a budget. But other than that, within the EU, Romania is without doubt the cheapest country, um, but most places are going to be around 11, 12,000 euros. For dentistry, you'd be looking predominantly in Spain if you're looking in Western Europe. And again, Central and Eastern Europe, Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria would be the kind of countries to look for there. In terms of tuition fees, again, there is one example in Italy of a public dentist, dental school, really, really tough to get into. Um, every year we have a lot of people who try that and fail, um, but it is possible, it does exist. Um, but then Romania, Bulgaria would be the next cheapest options. Uh, Croatia, Czech Republic, Poland, Latvia, all pretty much of a muchness. Spain is only slightly more expensive at the bottom end than Central and Eastern Europe. And that is part of the reason why Spain has come to dominate dentistry in a way that no country has come to dominate medicine just yet. 
For veterinary medicine, there are fewer options. Um, and the only country where there are more than one option taught in English, or the only countries rather, are Poland and Bulgaria. Most countries in Central and Eastern Europe have one vet school that, uh, well, one vet school full stop. And quite often by now, they teach in English. Tuition fees there are in a range between four and a half and 10,000 euros per year, I would say. So that just sets the scene as to what your options are. I'd be happy to talk to you about options in other countries, but realistically, North America, Australia, gonna cost you an absolute fortune. You're not gonna get into Canada, full stop. They don't teach foreign students uh, for medicine and veterinary for sure. Um, so limited options elsewhere. Obviously the Caribbean comes up as a place that some people will look at, but in terms of value for money, affordability and quality, we tend to find that Europe is, is more than enough for most students. So what I'd like to do now is look at some of the practical issues you need to think about when looking at medical dental schools abroad. And I want to really bring this back to what you need to think about before you decide whether or not you're gonna do this. Have you really thought about living abroad in another country for five, six, seven years? This is a big step. It's not something that you should just do because the UK didn't work out. It is something that you need to give some thought to. One of the worst situations we get is when people call us on results day, having missed their offer in the UK, and then saying to us, I now really, really wanna go and study abroad. We go to the effort of finding them a place, which is difficult, I'll promise you. And then the following Monday, they spin around and they're like, oh, actually I thought about it over the weekend. I don't wanna go. This is totally understandable. I get it. But do your planning on this. Think about the implications of this before you get stuck into the actual application process. Another large part of this comes to do with languages. I know what it's like in the UK. Many people think that learning another language is impossible. It's not impossible, but you have to do it um, to deal with patients and you have to want to do it. Otherwise, it's going to be a real uphill struggle. And I do have to say that some languages are much easier to learn than others. Spanish and Italian would almost certainly be easier to learn, shall I say, than, I don't know, Bulgarian or Czech or Hungarian or something like that. Now, the next thing I've put up here takes it away from you as an individual a little bit, thinking beyond, you know, can you afford it? Can you do it? Is it something you're comfortable with? This really is the first question I would ask any medical, dental or veterinary school. And to be honest, it's more of an issue in medical schools than the others. How many students are admitted into the first year and how many graduate on time? Now, the reason why I ask this question is quite simply because a lot of people get fixated on things like entry requirements. You know, can I get a place? You can get a place. I am pretty much certain I can get any of you a place somewhere in medicine. The point is, why would I bother? And the reason why I say that is because you've got to assess not only your chances of getting in, but also your chances of getting out the other end on time with minimal interruption, minimal repeated years or anything like that. And when you start delving into and looking at all of the medical schools out there, you might find some real variation in terms of class sizes. Some universities that we're aware of, they can recruit over a thousand people into first year medicine. I mean, what is the point of that? One example where I can give you real numbers is the University of Debrecen in Hungary. I know that their first year, they take in around 400 students for medicine. In an average year, 125 of those will graduate on time. What's happened to the rest of them? Well, some of them have had a study delay and they'll graduate the next year, which in the greater scheme of things, isn't a disaster. But also some of them have dropped out, completely disappeared. Some of them might have transferred to other medical schools, but I promise you, Transferring is a waste of time and money. Don't go into this thinking you're gonna to need to transfer. You know, if it happens, it happens, but I would absolutely never recommend starting at one dental school or medical school thinking, oh, after a year of this or two years, I'll be able to move somewhere else. You almost certainly won't. And if you can, it will be with a loss of time or money. So you do need to spend some time thinking about these considerations, far more important perhaps than just what the entry requirements are. But coming on to the entry requirements now, are these easier than in the UK? For most countries, I'm going to say yes, um, but that's only because the UK is so ridiculously difficult. 
the idea that you're going to need a fistful of A stars to get into a medical school in Europe or a dental school, probably not accurate. For most medical schools, and indeed most dental schools in Central Europe, your A level grades actually aren't that important. Yes, they will probably specify that you need biology, chemistry, and one other, um, but your grades possibly won't matter because usually they won't look at your A-levels, they will look at how you perform on an entrance exam, and that will be the first filter. For dental schools, the ones that we work with in Spain, the grades have been going up over time. Um, this year, ABB is perfectly normal, but if you've got Bs in biology, chemistry, and something else at A-level, you'll probably be fine. So I would suggest for dentistry, if you've got ABB, you've got plenty of options. If you've got below that, you've got options, but not quite as many. For medicine, well, the issue isn't really how well you do in your A-levels. The issue is how well prepared you are for the entrance exam that you are most likely going to have to take. What are these entrance exams? Well, the first thing to say is they are not the UCAT and they are not the BMAT. I am aware of one or two medical schools that will accept the BMAT if you've done it in the re relevant window. So if you do the BMAT next September, October, that might count towards an application the following uh, for the following October, September. Let's put it that way. I can't off the top of my head think of anywhere that accepts the UCAT. There might be one or two places that do that. There are one or two medical schools. One of the faculties of Charles University in Prague will accept, you know, if you've got ABB, you'll be exempt from the medical, the entrance exam, but almost certainly you are going to have to take an entrance exam. These entrance exams are different for pretty much every university. In Italy, they have one centralized exam for the public universities, but the private universities all have their own exams. And basically, you take these exams, you're competing with everybody else who wants to go and study there that particular year. So, and then you will be ranked and you'll be ranked according to how you do on the exam. You might find one or two universities will try and introduce an element of, you know, they'll try and wait it a little bit to look at your A-level or high school diploma a little bit. Um, but this is difficult when you're trying to compare students from so many different education systems in so many different countries. It's often fairer to just reject everything and look only at the test. This is what happens, for example, with work experience as well. In the UK, we have a culture of needing loads of work experience to get a place at medical or dental school. Elsewhere in the world, they don't care. They don't expect their local students to have it, so they don't ask for it from anybody. What will be included in the entrance exam? Well, more often than not, they are multiple choice questions. Biology and chemistry are fairly standard. Um, I have got some examples of the curriculum and some papers that I can send out to you uh, so you can get a sense of what these things look like. They will possibly also include maths and or physics. Certainly Polish medical schools will, Croatian medical and dental schools will as well. And logic can be quite common. So the kind of questions that you find on the UCAT, the BMAT, they might show up in a medical school exam abroad. One thing I will just say about the logic questions, and um, this actually surprised me this year and not in a good way, um, with some of the uh, private Italian medical schools that we work with, we actually found that British students' performance on the logic section of the test was a lot below what we would have hoped for. Biology and chemistry, absolutely fine, but the logic really, really you know, tripped them up. And in the past, I've been very, very skeptical about these kind of preparation courses that a lot of people offer to help people prepare for these exams. But I am starting to change my mind about these. I do think, actually, if you are going to think about doing an exam that includes logic elements to it, you need to perhaps do more than just a couple of sample tests to get your score up to not just the pass mark, because the pass mark is often really quite low but to the mark that means that you will be made an offer. Because obviously, if there are 40 places, you have to score in the top 40 to be made an offer. This, by the way, is one of the other reasons why deferred entry is not even worth considering for most medical schools. The reason for that is because you're competing against everybody in that particular year for a place. So the idea that you could then roll that over to the following year, well, it depends. Next year, there might be better people applying, in which case you wouldn't have gotten a place. So, you know, only apply in the year that you want to go there. 
How do entrance exams happen? This has actually been problematic in the last year. COVID-19 quite obviously has made a lot of these tests online, but a lot of universities are extremely reluctant to do these things online. Um, I don't really know why. I suspect it's partly because they want people to visit. And, you know, because obviously if you visit, you've got more of a connection to the university. It shows that you are perhaps a little bit more serious. So moving all these tests online is something that universities are doing because they've had to, but not because they've wanted to. So if a test is online right now, don't whatever you do assume that it's going to be online for the foreseeable future. I think that is actually unlikely. So those are the things you need to bear in mind. I've introduced you to money, the kind of things you need to think about, the kind of entrance exam that you're, or the entrance process that you're going to go through. What I'd like to do now is talk about the practical steps that you need to take to make this happen. And the first thing I need to say is that getting abroad is not simple. You're probably going to need to consider more than one option. This is definitely true in medicine, less so in veterinary and dentistry, um, where I have a little bit more of an oversight and can actually see just from the strength of your application what your chances are likely to be. The next thing I've got to say is that if you are applying in the UK, you know, you're probably not going to be fully committed to applying abroad at the same time. And I understand that. And that's part of the reason why I've organized this webinar for right now, because I think what you need to do is your homework into international options. But if you are applying in the UK, you don't actually need to physically push the button on anything right now. And I would actually try to discourage you from applying in both places at the same time, simply because it's complicated. You will lose money if you do this. Because if you get a place, you've got to be prepared to reserve it by paying a deposit. And that could be anything from, well, the smallest one I'm aware of is about 500 euros, but it could be anything up to seven and a half, uh, 10,000 euros in some cases. And I wouldn't risk that money if you're not sure that you want to go through with it. The other thing you need to consider when you're coming up with perhaps more than one option that you might want to look at is you need to look at the relative application deadlines and test dates. The reason why I say that is because you're going to have to prepare for the tests and don't whatever you do allow a medical school test to interfere with your A-levels. I think that's absolutely foolhardy to do that. But you also need to bear in mind, and what we try to do with a lot of the people we work with, is that certain options are more, you know, are, are or get full at different times, is perhaps the best way to put it. With medical schools, the entrance exams happen once a year sometimes, and they happen at only that time of the year. So if you miss it, that's it, you've missed out. So we try to advise people, come up with your favorite options. And usually what that means with the ones that we work with is that if you can afford the private medical schools, and I don't take this for granted because you are paying for this yourself, there is no medical school anywhere that's going to give you significant funding to do this. So all of those fees I mentioned earlier are going to have to be paid for by yourself. And that is a limiting factor. But if you have got the medical schools within your budget in Italy, then I would suggest going for those. Because if you get a place, fantastic, you're done. If not, you've still got time to apply to the other ones. Central European, the German option we've got, and the Cypriot ones that we work with, they would still typically have places till around this time of year. Some of the Central European ones will be, you know, still recruiting students after results day. There's no denying that. The public medical schools in Italy that I mentioned, these are a little bit different. These are actually problematic, not because you have to apply early, but because you have to apply so last minute. Um, their entrance exam, the IMAT, which is the international equivalent to the BMAT, only happens in September. And the course starts in October. So you've pretty much got to apply, take the exam, and move to Italy within a matter of months. The deadline for applying for the entrance exam is before A-level results day, however, and this catches people out every year because they look at it and they think, oh, well, I can still apply to Italy. They haven't had the exams yet. Yeah, but the deadline for applying for the exam 
is in July. So if you are thinking you might need the public universities in Italy, if you're waiting on an offer for next September in the or next on next results day, and you're not sure if it's going to work out for you in the UK, you might want to think about signing up to take the exam. It will cost you like 160 euros or something like that, just to have that option available to you if you need it, because otherwise you probably will be looking at, well, certainly if you're looking at Italy, you'll be looking at a gap year. When do dental schools get full? This is a very different question because Spanish dental schools don't usually work on an entrance exam. Um, they will, one does, the, the one in Barcelona, but most of the others have their own online tests or don't, or interviews, or don't have any tests at all, and look at you pretty much the same way as we would do in the UK, based on, you know, they will take work experience into consideration sometimes, but predicted grades, GCSE performance, things like that. Spanish dental schools are, well, basically they operate rolling admissions, which means that you can apply, once they're open, some of them are open now for 2022 already, one or two of them won't open until December, January, but once they are open, you apply, they have a look at you, they like you, bang, that's it, you get an offer and away you go. And when they are full, they are full. Spanish dental schools this year are all full for 2021 already. In some cases have been already for a couple of months. In previous years, we've had places on results day for Spanish dental schools. That is definitely not going to happen this year. And if I was gam I was betting on it, I'd say it's not going to happen in 2022 either. So things are changing there. Also, in terms of the number of places available at Spanish dental schools, they've been growing a lot, but they won't grow much more because they're very, very regulated by um, the by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education in Spain. So right now there are probably somewhere around about, across the eight dental schools there, 500 odd seats in English for study of dentistry. And that has had a massive impact on Central European dental schools. Some of them don't even get full anymore because people are going to Spain in much greater numbers. So I would say results day, you probably could find somewhere in Central Europe if that's the way you wanted to go. There is one public dental school in Italy, same exam procedure as I mentioned before, um, but you need to, like I said, you've got to register for it before A-level results day. And because there's only one, and there's only something like 60 places, it's almost impossible to get in. So it's there, it is an option. I mention it just to be complete. With veterinary medicine, by the way, it's a bit like, it's kind of a hybrid between the two. Zagreb that we work with, it's rolling, well, they have application windows, but effectively it's rolling admissions. We get a good candidate, we like them, we can get them an offer. Um, other places like Warsaw, uh, Brno, Kozice, are you do exams at certain times of year. So how does this fit with your UCAS applications? Well, I think I've already outlined a few ways in which it doesn't. There is no fit between the two. You're trying to juggle two different systems or many different systems that don't mesh together neatly. So be prepared for having to take some decisions before you're absolutely ready for it, perhaps. And also be prepared for, you know, application deadlines, start dates and things like that that just won't match up. Looking at the UK system, 15th of October, obviously, is well, the early early deadline for applications, which you will have to do for medicine, dentistry, veterinary, and so on. This is where my interests and yours diverge, let's put it this way. Because in my, for me to help you, the sooner you get rejected, the better. But obviously nobody wants to get rejected before even having an interview or anything like that. But the fact of the matter is, if you get rejected December, January, from all four medical or dental schools, I can almost certainly help you. You know, if you've got the kind of grades that made you a sensible candidate in the first place, I will find you somewhere abroad that will probably be happy to take you. And we've probably got the options of, or the choice of everything out there. Things get harder the later this happens. So if you have interviews and you get rejections after those in late March, as is usual, early May, as seems to have happened this year, um, most of the options will have, well, some of the options will have gone. The medical schools in Italy, the public, the private ones I mentioned, too late. Dentistry in Spain, one or two of the options, too late for sure. One or two of the others, perhaps still offers. Um, 
And this year, we're already set. And, and yeah, and if you get offers, then the whole thing gets delayed even further to August. And when results day comes around, usually my phone will ring off the hook. In previous years, I've been able to get people into Croatia and Spain and Cyprus. This year, I'm reckoning only Cyprus. That will probably be the only option that we have available on results day. And even then, I can't guarantee that for medicine. For dentistry, I think I probably can though. So there are options there, but you know, you just have to be a little bit more, you have to be aware of the, the consequences of trying to apply in the UK. And I know for financial reasons, you're gonna be applying in the UK first uh, anyway. That makes perfect sense to me. And we will try to accommodate that. Just be honest with us what you're doing if you're gonna apply through us. Now, moving on to other areas, not specifically related to how to apply, but to the kind of questions that we get all the time, um, which are logical and make perfect sense, um, but people do tend to fixate on them. And I would say you need to know this, but you don't need to keep asking the same question. Obviously, Brexit, recognition of EU qualifications. I know full well that most of you are gonna to wanna to come back to the UK and work. That's natural enough. And is that guaranteed to you if you qualify elsewhere within the European Union? Well, if you qualify in Ireland, yes, it is. Okay. But let's be honest, you're not going to get in in Ireland. For dentistry, unfortunately, unfortunately, nothing has changed. And unfortunately, it will. And the reason why I'm saying unfortunately quite so much is because what's happened is the General Dental Council has delayed making a decision on this. They've decided we'll wait and see what happens which means if you're applying right now, there's not much clarity about what's gonna happen after January the 1st, 2023. If you graduate before then, things have not changed. Everything will be normal. You graduate after then, things will probably change. What does that mean? Don't know. It might mean you have to do the overseas registration exam. It might mean no change. It might mean that certain EU medical and dental schools are added to a list that means that automatic recognition is possible. The one thing I would say, and again, this comes from feedback I've received from dentists as much as anything else, is that the ORE system will not survive hundreds more British or British nationals qualified abroad going through it. It will just quite simply overload the system. Something is gonna have to change. Medicine, I just checked on the GMC's website before this webinar again, there is no real clarity at this time. And this is partly because things are changing in the UK with licensing exams for British graduates. The best information I can find is that international graduates will have to go through the same process as British graduates. So there is actually no disadvantage to studying abroad, but I am not convinced that's gonna remain the case. With veterinary medicine, I'm happy to say, that we know the answer to this question. The answer to this question has got nothing to do with the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons necessarily, and everything to do with EAEVE, -E, which if you're not coming across it before, is the European Association of Establishments of Veterinary Education. Anybody who's on their accredited list will be recognized forever until there's a policy change at, at some unforeseen moment in time. We have actually, after a general meeting of the EAEVE last week, got the most up-to-date information on that. So you wanna know if a vet school's been accredited or recognized or accepted for membership, we can tell you that. So that, that, that addresses what I hope are a few of the questions that you might have with regards to medicine and veterinary and, and dentistry abroad. What I've put up here on this slide are the places where we can actually help you a little bit further. For medicine, I've already mentioned private medical schools in Italy, like Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore and Humanitas University. For the public universities, nobody can really help you. There aren't really any agents or anybody like that working with those universities. The system is not great for applying to those places, but you'll figure it out. Uh, we can help you apply to European University of Cyprus, UMCH is University Medical Center Hamburg or campus in Hamburg. Um, and this is a new option for us. We're working with them for the first time this year. Um, it's expensive. It is a Romanian qualification rather than a German one. It is taught fully in English, excellent facilities. Definitely want to recommend, particularly if you're thinking you might want to work in Germany after you graduate. And the University of Rijeka in Croatia, we've been working with them for a number of years right now. A handful of British students go there every year. 
The reason why we like Riaka is because, like I was saying before, with the issue around numbers, they only take 50 students into their first year and they look after their 50 students. It's not like they take in 500 and the 50 graduate fine, you know, so they don't play the numbers game and they care about their students. Veterinary medicine, we have a very, very strong relationship with the University of Zagreb. Uh, we were actually, we actually helped them launch their program in English about six years ago. Um, they have 35 places every year, probably between five and eight every year from the UK and Ireland, uh, the rest from Germany, Italy, uh, Israel, places like that. But the dean of the, the program there is very, very helpful and forthcoming. Um, so we know that our students there are very well looked after. For dentistry, it really is about Spain as far as we're concerned. That is the niche that we've carved out. We work with three dental schools there, which is actually five different campuses. There are two for UCAM and two for UE, uh, one in Valencia and Madrid for UE. UCAM is in Murcia and in Cartagena. UCV in Valencia is probably the one that gets full quickest. And that's probably the most British of all the dental schools. So if you wanted to go to a class that looks and feels like a dental school in the UK, UCV would be the one. Although I have to say that trend is getting a little bit weaker now. We are finding there are more Irish, more Dutch students there, so that's changing. Um, University of Zagreb, we also work with for dentistry. That is a little bit difficult for us because it is a six year master of dentistry qualification. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but it is something more than most people actually want. So you have to be sure that it's the right thing for you. And University, European University of Cyprus, again, excellent facilities, excellent quality of education, great place to study, a great place to live is Cyprus as well. Um, but it is that little bit further away from the UK. So that's part of the reason why we're less likely, to, it's less popular with British students, but it does fill up, um, but it will fill up slightly slower than the Spanish options. So those are some of the places that we can help you. Um, for some of these, I would describe our relationship as that of an agent, as in we get paid for putting you in there. Um, for others, we are their representative in the UK, which means that our financial relationship has got absolutely nothing to do with you. Um, we don't charge students money to apply through us. What we do is reserve the right to tell you we're not going to work with you because we can't help you. Uh, so if there's no chance that you're going to get in. We're going to knock it on the head very, very quickly. The one place where we do charge people to apply is UCV, and that's quite simply an issue of supply and demand. It's if we didn't charge you, we would spend our whole life filling out dentistry applications for people who weren't serious, and that got ridiculous. The first year we did that, we must have filed about 80 applications for 20 places, so we stopped that. It's just ridiculous. We can't justify spending time and effort on that. So that's literally just to regulate behavior, if you like. Um, but the other universities, particularly in the medical schools, we don't charge fees up front. You're usually going to have to pay some kind of application fee to the university. In the case of the medical schools we work with in Italy, they're probably around about 150, 160 euros. Uh, Croatia is about 50 euros. Cyprus is also 52 euros, I believe. Uh, Hamburg is expensive. It's like 450 euros. I have no idea why it's quite so much. It's something that's I don't necessarily understand, but that's the way that they work and they do it for everybody. And I think this is an important point to be making, whether you're applying directly, applying through an agent or whatever, the key thing you need really above anything else is transparency. Um, the relationships, like I said at the beginning, that universities, agents, students have are all different, but this is largely because all universities are convinced they know best. And sometimes they're pretty good. Sometimes they're absolutely hopeless. Sometimes they really do need a helping hand to, you know, get students in there. This is particularly true the more you look at in Central and Eastern Europe. They have some very strange ideas as to how you should be applying. Also with an agent, they can help with a lot of the paperwork. A lot of universities will ask you for things which just sound frankly bizarre, like your birth certificate or translated, nostrificated GCSE qualifications and stuff like that. Quite possibly you're going to need help navigating all of these things and paying somebody to do that. Is that the end of the world? I don't think so. Um, I would also say, however, that in our experience, and part of the reason why we don't work with Bulgaria and Romania is because there are quite so many agents out there, all of them telling slightly different stories and 
because I don't really have any first-hand insight into those medical schools, I'm just not getting involved. Um, that's not a reflection of quality of these places, although I suppose I, yeah, maybe it is a little bit, um, but it is a quality of experience, a quality of outcomes. You know, those issues about over-recruiting and not caring about their students, that does happen. Um, also, all sorts of stories about corruption. But any student, any story I hear from a student, I will take with a pinch of salt. Students are not the best guides to whether they've been treated fairly or not at medical schools. Um, sometimes I hear some absolute horror stories and they are genuine. Other times it's like, well, you failed three years. What did you expect? Of course, you were going to be kicked out, you know? So I have some sympathy, but not total sympathy with students who encounter difficulties at these medical schools. But like I was saying, on quality as well, one issue I do just want to point out, uh, Universita Catholica del Sacro Cuore on this slide, it's a top 150 in the world medical school. It's one of the very best out there. Humanitas University, not quite so highly ranked, but I would argue is actually better, certainly in terms of the research that it's doing. So are these poorer options than British medical schools? No, absolutely not. You look at the facilities at Spanish dental schools, they are way better than what you'll find at most British dental schools. So, you know, don't look at these places as being inferior teaching establishments. They just aren't, or not always. Um, what they are, however, is in a different country, requiring you to learn a different language and requiring you to spend your own money up front rather than getting student loans and worrying about later whether you're going to pay them off, which, of course, if you qualify in these professions, you are going to pay them off. So anyway, hopefully that now gives you a bit of an insight into who we are, what we can tell you about, and perhaps more importantly than that, what kind of issues you need to think about now, even if you're not going to act on them now. The summer holiday is a great time for you to go out there, research what exists, research what budget you need, research what time and effort you'd have to put into the entrance exam, and then deciding, you know, when you're going to apply. And for those of you who perhaps don't have the strongest GCSEs who already know that the UK is not going to be an option for you, um, yeah, do put perhaps a little bit more thought into this than if you are on target for, I don't know, a couple of A stars and an A, then this might be something that sits on the back burner for a while. I think most of you might have found us through our various websites initially anyway. We do update the astarfuture.co.uk study medicine abroad page quite often. Uh, you can get in touch with us by email and Twitter at any time.